Today's discussion is about the uh, Cascade Crossing project, the transmission line project that's going to be coming in um, and going through just about 27 miles of the Mount Hood National Forest down by Mount Jefferson. Um, it's proposed. It's proposed. It's proposed. We're just in the scoping period right now, and so they're, they put out the, the, the intent to scope out and then create an environmental impact statement at which point they'll be opening up for comments and that kind of thing again. Um, it's really interesting though because we already have you know, some corridors we can look at that are transmission corridors as well. And I wanted to just, while we're here at the ranger station, just point out to folks that um, on the map here, what we're about to see is this, this tiny little thin line. You can come up here and take a look at it too. Or this little dotted line with the little dots along the line here, this is the transmission corridor. And the right? existing one. The existing one. So this little line with little dots on it are the power lines we're about to see when we drive up to the trailhead. Um, and I chose this site because it has some really good views of Mount Hood as well as really good views of how extensive the impacts of these transmission corridors are because they're not just, you know, a little bit of, of impact in one small area. They're spread out, tremendously long and tremendously wide. It fragments habitat. It affects, you know, it affects water issues in more than just one location. It's, it's a very broad reaching effect. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Um, any questions? I'm, <laughs> I'm Zach. <laughs> um, I volunteer with Bark doing this kind of stuff fairly regularly. Um, I, I really enjoy the whole process of going through and taking a look at a project, seeing where the validity or non-validity of it stands and saying, you know, well, I don't really think that we need to have the, ex the expanded capacity. So, so yeah, any questions, anybody? Where no? does the power line come from? Where was it originate? So it's going to it's going to originate if they if the proposal goes through. Um, out along 84, there are a number of wind farm projects and natural gas projects that are, that are proposed or already in place up there. Excuse me. And the idea is to bring additional capacity for transferring transmitting energy from out there into Portland area, into Salem, across the Cascades. Um, they haven't proved the need for the additional capacity yet. Um, they're still going through, and that's one of the discussions they're having still. Another issue is that there's a much wider, much larger project in place already that's going through federal courts at the moment because there's a big lawsuit about it. Um, it was a Bush era project or Bush era proposal called the Westwide Energy Corridors proposal. Mm -hmm. And it was mapping out all the different corridors that they wanted to use for developing natural gas, power lines, et cetera, in the Northwest. Um, the West White Energy Corridor Project, um, I, I've read some of the EIS, had some major issues with how it was set up as far as it was designed to expedite environmental impact statements um, for future projects. At the same time as, because it, it was claiming that it was going to be considering the impacts initially before the um, project, even, project even, even went through. Instead, it just said that, well, write an environmental impact statement and making a plan has no environmental impact, though the project eventually will, yada, yada. They're currently um, in court on the issue, and so a lot of things are actually closed to public, so I, I, I don't know a lot of the details anymore, honestly. Is that appeals that. court or... Huh? Is that appeals court or federal court? Federal court, I believe, right now. We're up at Lolo Pass on the Pacific Crest Trail, and we're going to be hiking north along the PCT um, to look at the transmission corridor owned by uh, the BPA, Bonneville Power Administration. So this, the, all those power lines we just passed are coming from Bonneville Dam? I believe, yeah. That's where, the, that's where the majority of, the, of those power lines um, bring energy from. Yeah. When you build a corridor, they generally also have it cut out wider for construction purposes to begin with. Yeah. And so what you'll have is you'll have the 
Corey were listed in the environmental impact statement or whatever they put out as being 250 feet, 150 feet, whatever they happen to say in a particular project. I think Palomar Pipeline was saying something in the range of 250 feet, something like that. Um, what you then are looking at in addition to that is anywhere between 150 to 200 feet to almost 350 feet in some cases to either side of the corridor, an additional cut. And so when you're thinking about putting in a uh, you know, transmission line and you're saying, oh, well, it's only going to pass through this much old growth, it's only going to be this wide, well, that width is a lot longer. Because that width also, when, when they say how wide it's going to be, is it including the extra width. Exactly. Um, and you can get some good views of that. I don't know if anybody was noticing as they walked up here how these trees right in front of us, there was a line where the trees became immediately taller yeah. right behind them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You guys noticed that? Yeah. That's the corridor. Yeah. That's what the additional cut was that they did. And there's even some of it, you can't get a good view over here because there's, there's been a lot of cuts here it looks like. But um, also on the drive-in, you probably could have noticed some of that too. Because there were cases where you could, you'd be looking over the side of the road, the side of the uh, corridor, and you'd see there was, there was a line of just shorter, younger trees, and it was a very distinct line yeah. that was cutting it and making it, ma making them taller. Yeah. So, so the impacts of the corridor are actually initially much greater, and even then, after that, they're maintained. You'll notice that they maintain this area. They keep everything cut down. They keep everything stunted um, because they can't have it interfere with the power lines. Yeah. Um, that messes with hydrology, as well as it requires application of herbicides, and it involves just really? a lot of mechanical harvesting, and it's a, it's a lot of work and a lot of you know maintenance to keep this corner this way. Um, and so even with that, you're still looking at an issue of damaging water quality then too. Especially when you can't let deep-rooted plants reestablish themselves. Nothing is left untouched these days. Powerful men. with their flitting smiles and make plans At the breakfast propaganda eating the table They make plans on how to gather all their wealth It's really oh so seductive Nothing else And you can really see a lot of the old cuts all through this area. And that's part of why I wanted to stop here too, was the old cuts and also, if you look out down the valley that way, you can get a really good yeah. view of the corridor. Look at that. And so it, it just really emphasizes the point that it's, we're not looking at just a point impact when we talk about building transmission corridors. We're looking at something that impacts vast, vast distances of land. And it, it impacts more than just one watershed. It crosses multiple watersheds. This corridor here crosses um, the Hood River over there. It runs through the Bull Run watershed, not through it, but borders on it. Um, goes past the Zigzag River. I mean, we're going through so many different areas here that you're, you're not impacting and causing, you know, siltation and run off into just one location. You're looking at many, many rivers that you're impacting and many, many locations you're impacting. Um, this is a really good dramatic location to mm -hmm. just take a look at that, as well as how heavily in the historically Mount Hood has been harvested, you know? One of the big things that Bark does is it provides 
um, a directed inlet for people to participate. We all have the right, and, and actually I, I think it's like my duty to participate in these decisions out in the forest and what's going on out here. Um, and our tool for that is NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. 1969, you said? Um, and what that allows us to do is, as the public, because these are our public lands, it gives us the opportunity to submit comments on the scoping, so we help to define how the actual framework of the project even is put into place. And then after the scoping, they'll release an, an environmental impact statement, and we get to write comments on the environmental impact statement, which will influence how the Forest Service and B BLM and other organizations act. Um, not to mention, we then have the right to, if we've submitted comments on either scoping or the EIS, the environmental impact statement, we can then bring in lawsuits oriented around those projects. So that is how we as the public can get involved. And so that's another, I like to emphasize that on the high side I lead people on because that's, that's what you can do. That's what we can all do, you know? That's our inlet. You don't have to work for the Forest Service to have an impact on how your public lands are used. It's really important to remember that, that these are our public lands too. It's not, they don't belong to a logging company. They don't belong to the Forest Service. They're, serve, they're there to serve us. They don't belong to the BLM. Um, or Bonneville. Or Bonneville. Mm -hmm. Or PGE. Hear that, PGE? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're, they're our public lands. So how they're used is used for us. And so if we don't think, as the public, that we want ex that additional capacity or another power line running through the National Forest, that's our responsibility to say so.